Welcome to the Derek Loudermilk Show. This is episode 394 with Dan Willis. In today's episode, we talk with Dan Willis, who has been many things. He has been a collaborator of Marcel Vogel, the IBM crystal researcher who created the Vogel cut quartz crystal. And we're going to get into some of the science around how Vogel cut crystals do what they do, their connection between breath and consciousness and intention and healing. And Dan was also one of the original witnesses of the Disclosure Project back in 2001. They had more than 50 witnesses that basically disclosed to the world that there are extraterrestrials in contact with the government, that we have UFOs, that we have free energy. And this was actually the biggest event at the National Press Club in history, and yet nobody heard about it. So get ready for an episode full of amazing stories, science, geometry, mathematics, and a little bit of guidance from extraterrestrial grad students thrown in. So without further ado, here is Dan Willis. Dan Willis, welcome to the show. Hey, Derek. (laughs) Great to be on your show. I would love to start by hearing a little bit about Marcel Vogel. I um, I have a few scientific heroes. Um, Richard Feynman was one. Marcel Vogel is one. And uh, actually, uh, a few months ago, I got to interview Stefan Schwartz, who spent time with Feynman. And, um, you know, it, it just it's so cool to have you because you had firsthand experience meeting and working with uh, Marcel Vogel. So I'm just curious, yeah, what what that was like for you to uh, be in touch with him. Well, it's interesting. Way back in 1977, I had a um, an ET interaction experience with a being that uh, was a Kundalini opening. It was interesting. I find out, you know, decades later that at the exact year, uh, Dr. Marcel Vogel was on a sacred mountain in India having a Kundalini opening experience as well uh i had no idea uh anyway to make a long story short um the being projected in sphere um a a sphere which had geometry going into it one like platonic solid into another like started with a star tetrahedron and then you know isosahedron dodecahedron you know going into infinity and came back and it was basically a kind of a download of what the matrix was about and at this time i had no idea of what platonic solids were or sacred geometry it left a burning passion in me to try to understand the matrix and it seemed that quartz crystals since the you know vast spaces of time and different cultures all had this reverence to this uh, clear stone that appeared to be an indication of an advanced science that we don't uh fully have an understanding of and the only person that was really doing any um you know not woo woo stuff but full on with you know planning on doing a laboratory and you know getting into the science of it was dr marcel vogel so i uh contacted him and i drove up from san diego up to san jose in the middle of a storm knocked on his door it was in the evening and uh he welcomed me in and i said i you know i'm fascinated about your work i i need i need to learn more about what you're doing funny he said first thing he said you're from another planet aren't you (laughs) and i said (laughs) i don't i don't know about that anyway i uh sat down on this couch and there was a doctor he was working with about two dozen medical doctors in the in san francisco bay area teaching him these techniques that he developed um um a um he turned off the lights and played classical music for beautiful classical music for about it seemed like 20 minutes or something like that in the dark (laughs) and then uh when we started the talk and a knock came on the door and a woman uh with her daughter came over and heard he was doing you know this healing work and she had this tumor that was on her ankle 
that was sticking out about a half an inch. And as the doctor and I observed, he did his procedure of with the breath and the crystal um, actually dematerialized the tumor in front of our eyes. And that left a lasting impression that this man has, um, has uh, understood something and, uh, and has uh, opened up a key in understanding about these sciences. And so, you know, he invited me at the time I was working for the Naval Electronic Systems Engineering System on all the, you know, the Navy's electronics equipments and everything like that. And so he invited me to be a research associate. And so I helped uh, procure uh, laboratory equipment, you know, like spectrophotometers and things like that, because he was about to retire from IBM and open up this full-on laboratory. IBM gave him the uh, electron microscope that he put together from, from scratch. And um, I, uh, I also traveled to the mines in Arkansas. That was a long trip. Uh, and gathered, you know, a whole huge batch of crystals, which I delivered. And that was used for, you know, for the first doctors for cutting these. Um, how all this came about <laughs> was that uh, in the uh, in the seventies, he uh, he had to give a creativity course to the engineers at IBM. He had about thirty engineers, very left brain thinking, you know, engineers, mm -hmm. and he was not a uh, left brain thing. He was a creative genius. He created the magnetic coatings on hard drives, red and blue phosphors on color television, liquid crystal systems he developed like we use on our displays and so forth. He had about 140 patents. He was a creative genius. And uh, he uh, had to do this course. So he was trying to figure out what to do for creativity. And he read this uh, article about Cleve Baxter, who was a CIA polygraph expert that was working with plants. Mm -hmm. And so um, he just, he crumpled it up and threw it in the trash. And he thought, oh, this is garbage. But then he thought, well, no, this might be a good experiment, you know? And so he, uh, he dug it out and uh, he hooked up a split leaf philodendron and a script chart recorder that's recording the response. He uh, burned a leaf and he got a response on the chart. And then the moment the thought formed in his mind, the instant the thought formed in his mind, it, did it, it squiggled. He said that squiggle changed his life. And so um, he was studying pranayama yoga, which was, you know, the science of breath and breathing. And he found that when he pulsed his breath, you know, like through the nostrils, like that, that with the intention and thought, he got a much greater response. Now, he was able to do this from seven miles away from the laboratory with his colleague and psychically tune into the plant. And then he also went to Pravchuk, Slovakia, on the other side of the planet and tuned into the plant and was able to make it squiggled. You know, he said the, you know, the inverse square law of distance doesn't apply. It's like instantaneous. So... Um, he was doing a lecture and uh, about you know the plant communication. It was written up in the book uh, the Secret Life of Plants. And um, a lady gave him a crystal, and he thought, oh, this is woo-woo stuff, right? <laughs> and so uh, he, he, he tried working with the crystal, and, he, and a colleague at IBM had a back problem, and he used the crystal, pulsed it, and it alleviated the back problem you know he said oh my god you know i've got to figure out a way how to make this you know in nature you know the crystals you know the, the crystals grow like this mm. and all the angles of a crystal are the same as the great pyramid in egypt which relates to the golden mean ratio and everything like that that acts as a transponder in the matrix you could say and so um can I pause you really quick? Just to just to clarify, he was testing whether the plants would respond to his thoughts. Of right. he was like, I'm. Was he projecting that he was going to burn them, or was he? What was he doing to try to get 
the plants and they're hooked up just like an electrode, like a lie detector type electrode thing. Right. Right. And uh, yeah, as soon as the, the intention of his thought formed, the, the plant reacted. Um, and so he had a, he had a dream. He got, he got a lot of stuff in dreams, uh, how to, how to do things. In fact, that's how he created the magnetic coating on the hard drive as it came to him and how, how to do this, uh, the sticky solution, you know, that goes on the hard drive. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, it came to him like in a dipyramidal form, like, uh, this type of crystal where it's like the, the tree of life in the Kabbalah, you know, is like the unmanifest from, you know, the source of all things down into the earthly manifestation. And so he, uh, he uh, started cutting the crystals in this form. One end was uh, the 52 degree angle, you know, 51.843 to be exact. And the other end was a 60 degree angle or thereabouts. He, he didn't know, um, and we'll get into that later, about uh, a being from another world, from another civilization, thousands of years in advance of our understanding, <laughs> uses the same geometries on their crystals that they use. So um, he, he cut this, and uh, his concept was that you know, with a laser, for example, you have two mirrors, right? And you have a like a ruby crystal, you photon excite it, and it starts oscillating back and forth. And each subsequent, because it's all in phase, each subsequent oscillation builds upon itself. So you have this incredible energy that's going on inside of a laser. One mirror is 100% reflective, the other one's 1%. And that 1% of the energy that's coming out one side is strong enough to cut through steel. So this cohering is very, very powerful. And so the quartz crystal, the way he was cutting it, was acting as a, a means to cohere the energies of mind. And, and so what he was doing is he developing uh, procedures using the breath and connecting in with the physical body. And... Uh, you understand that uh, our reality is multi-dimensional, many, many densities of, of frequencies, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, the, the quartz crystal is resonant simultaneously at the same time in all these different dimensions. So uh, it acts as a bridge between these dimensions. And so the, the higher forms the lower 3D physical form that we are, not the other way around. And so when you're able to go in and link to that higher pattern, let's say you have a, a dissonant pattern, whatever the problem is in the body, uh, if you're able to go in there and release that, amazing transform, like the tumor disappearing in front of our eyes, amazing transformation. I, I used it a a number of times, uh, Marcel cut that crystal as a gift for me, you know, for helping with the laboratory and everything. And uh, first time I ever used it, I was getting on the plane back to San Diego and there was a football player holding his knee in pain. He just had surgery, right? And so, you know, I'm thinking, well, I've been given a gift. <laughs> and so I uh, said to him, well, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I'm kind of an experimental scientist. If you like, we can try some experimental procedures, you know, the first time, you know, using it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I did the procedures that Marcel uh, showed me and um, the guy got off the plane and he was pointing from his parents. He said, that, that guy, he, he fixed my leg. <laughs> you know, I was like, but I didn't do it. I facilitated him, you know, healing himself because uh, I facilitated that. And, so I, uh, I definitely want to, I want to yes. uh, ask a bit more about the healing process, but I also just love to hear like, um, so I know you, you know, you helped him set up the laboratory. Like, what was he like as a person for you? Or what was your relationship like the two of you? Marcel and I were close friends. Um, 
We uh, did a no number of things together. I remember touring Lawrence Livermore Laboratories with him. Um, I um, worked on a number of projects that were, you know, like looking at out of the Outer Limits movie, you know. Um, one was uh, a camera that came out of uh, out of England, made back in the 1950s. Uh, it was patented by the European Patent Office called the Delaware Camera. What was fascinating about this camera that stood about five and a half feet tall, it had tone oscillators, radionic dials, it had a chamber above with lenses and reflectors that went onto a photographic plate. You could take a drop of blood and tune in to the individual and the sound oscillators and everything that you have to align it with the earth and everything project it into space in three dimensions, a holographic uh, projection, which was captured on a, on the film. The silver emulsion on the film reacted to it. And thousands of photos were taken. Uh, one example, the thing that was, I'm very familiar with radionic instruments and, you know, it acts as a tuning focus for the mind. Um, this one had the ability to go forwards and backwards in the time. It had a time spiral in it. Like this one woman was pregnant and she was like 50 miles away. And you could see the, the fetus and you can move it forward and backwards in the time, seeing it progress. Um, what's interesting is, you know, I've been ever since my in, involvement with, um, you know, because my top secret clearance in the military and being involved as a disclosure witness i've become friends with um, many of these people in the secret space program talking about mm -hmm. the med bed technology and that uh how the med beds work is that it holographically takes a photo of you and this the, everything is holographic in the universe and so when they take a photo it goes back to the point of your conception and so you have these slices of time you could say that go back in time and so what they do is say you lose your arm or something or leg um or any situation you can tune back through time before that happened and then repattern re repair <laughs> i mean it's like you're 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 pairing, they, they oscillate basically the holographic pattern of that element back in time. And it, within a matter of hours, the arm is fully restored. Um, I've talked to a number of uh, people who have personally firsthand experienced this with the, uh, with the med beds. Amazing. Oh, yeah, it's incredible technology. You know, we need to get rid of this. Uh, my my great grandfather was the president of Homeopathic Medical Society. It was going up against the evil Rockefeller allopathic medicine, and uh, you know the whole medical system is so corrupt. We need to replace this with new modalities that are not based on pharmaceuticals, but energetic uh, means of of healing people. And so what you were saying about the mechanism, like where you worked on the football player's leg on the airplane is sounds very similar. You're, you're saying like reverting to a, the information in a field that's going to like, is a sort of a higher state of perfection that can then reset the sort of physical, um, the 3d is that how the, how the procedure works is that, um, you, you know, and everything's done with love because love is a, at the highest, at the highest densities, you could say is more aligned with love. And as it comes down into the lower densities, there's less of an alignment of, of love, but we're all, everything's all connected. And, and so in order to move energy without dissonance there's always uh, that connection with love you know doing doing something because you, you care about somebody um so what in a it, it's kind of involved but kind of in a condensed simplified manner uh the procedure is the person 
does you do deep breathing with the person and in sync with the person and you go in into the thymus area which acts as a witness for the whole body you ask the person um to and usually if you have pain or you have a problem it's pretty easy you know to tune into where the problem is you ask to be shown where the you know you the, the person who you're working with you they look in and see what is the root cause where is the course you know and to tune their mind on it and lock on that and when they do you start to amplify the field and it becomes sometimes a little more painful actually you're increasing energy into the area you know just like an electronic circuit you start pumping a whole lot of energy into something that is not tuned it's going to have resistance right and so um and through the breath, the breath is more than just breathing in and out oxygen and feeding hemoglobin and all that. It's more of a, in, a multidimensional information transfer that happens when we inhale and exhale. And so when you go in and ask to be shown where is the core problem, when you build up a couple of breaths and then there's a release breath, then it goes, release, you know, like that. And amazing transformations happen in at that point. Um, and it, it's kind of like this big dramatic thing, you know, it's like, you know, like, all right, release, you know, and then and you have to fill in with love, you know, because love is the integrative force of the universe. Um, and amazing transformations happen in that process of using the crystals. Is there... Um... I'm not sure on your on your site is there like this process is uh, outlined for people to go and learn themselves if they get a Vogel cut crystal or yeah in uh, in honor of Marcel I put together uh, MarcelVogel.org um, all those procedures all the lab notes and everything with the Delaware camera and also goes into the, the latest uh, information that I, for the last year, I've been uh, interacting from a being with another world who's a scientist on the science of crystals. And what we, uh, what what's amazing is my, my friend, Elena Danan, uh, she's a French um, archaeologist that worked in Egypt for some time. And when she was like, nine years old she was abducted by the uh gray extraterrestrials and she was had an implant put in her and she was rescued by the galactic federation of worlds who they had to repurpose the implant and now it's like a quantum communication device so that uh, her contact a person who went in and saved her his name's thor henry redion what uh what he sees and hears she sees and hears and then what she sees and hears he sees and hears. you know so they have oh, this, wow. this quantum communication device and this is how uh i did a show with her and um she said that uh thorhan's younger brother is going to university in the pleiades and understanding how to terraform planets so they call it star making and that uh he has a little bit of knowledge on you know the matrix and crystals you know and so uh, I started April of last year, uh, almost exactly a year to this, this date, I um, put forth a number of questions. And uh, Elena and I were both kind of blown away by the information matched in so m what Marcel Vogel was able to establish in a laboratory and quantify uh matched what jenhan was saying and so um the, the uh communication log is now at a hundred pages of question answer question answer and they have to do it that way because of the prime directive the prime directive is not just something that was in star trek the prime directive is actually something that's actual and real it, it turns out fascinatingly enough that um uh, um Leslie, uh, 
Leslie Stevens, yeah. Uh, he he was the uh, creator of the Outer Limits series. As he was in Office of Naval Intelligence. <laughs> His father was Admiral Leslie Stevens, who was uh, head of psychological warfare with, with the Navy and his contemporary with Admiral Rick Oboda, who was working with 29 Navy spies that were embedded into the Nazi secret space program that was going on in Antarctica, you know, back in the 40s. Um so the Galactic Federation uh, was working with uh, Leslie Stevens and Gene Roddenberry, who was on the set with him, and gave him the whole the whole script and everything for Star Trek and the prime directive. My friend, Dr. Michael Sala, who's been researching this ever since he was inspired from the event I participated in at the National Press mm -hmm. Club back in 2001. Um, it found out that he found this book that Elena had no idea that laid out the prime directive and it's exactly mm. <laughs> word for word, uh, almost. So, um, they, um, they, they, you know, they're not here to save us and <laughs> let us know. They want us to basically, you know, save ourselves, you know, and to become awake and aware of what's going on. And so, um, so the, the prime directive is like kind of a non-interference uh, directive where they can't, he, like Jen Han can, just can't tell me everything. I have to ask this very specific question and he will specifically answer that question. But once in a while, he'll drop a little, a little, a little extra thing that opens up another door you know, like the, uh, uh, am I correct that he, um, he, there was like something that would have, um, gone against the prime directive that he had to get special permission to reveal or release. Correct. Correct. In fact, I asked one question <laughs> that, uh, apparently it raised a bunch of red flags. Um, I was asking him about the, um, in the in the quartz crystal lattice, you have you know the the, the piezoelectric effect where you have uh, basically like six pointed stars, and the charge triads they have a positive and negative in the middle, and when the physical pressure is put on a crystal, it creates a uh, voltage offset. It's called like your cigarette lighters that you know makes a spark. You know it, mm -hmm. from the physical pressure. Um, I asked him about that being a, a dimensional portal. And he said, he said uh, this is one of the things in the prime directive that we're not you know, supposed to. So he had to get special permission. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what Marcel didn't know and would have loved to have known, he didn't, he didn't realize it, but uh, you know, Marcel started out with a, with a four-sided crystal like this. Mm -hmm. And then he felt that the energy spun in vortex. So the energy does vortex. So the crystals grow in the left and right-handed spirals naturally. And then they start at the... Uh, and there's, there's a, a six-sided crystal. And then they went to... Like, here's an, an eight-sided and then they kept on going up to more sides and and here is a, a 16 sided but what marcel didn't realize is that he missed something when he went past the six sided because the crystal according to jen han mm -hmm. the crystal needs to be cut in respect to the hexagonal core matrix of the crystal in other words as it grows in nature so the alignment is not only on the C axis, which is the growth axis of the crystal, so that both points on the crystal are aligned perfectly with this C axis. And then the, the hexagonal core has to be aligned perfectly with the three axes of the uh, hexagonal core. And, uh, but Jen Han was much more specific on the angles than Marcel, you know, one's a 51.843 degree angle, or 52 is what they, they rounded off to, and the other one's a 60 degree angle. And what's interesting about the 60 degree angle is uh, 
Jen Han said that the entire, the secret of the universe is a tetrahedral fractal uh, holographic geometry. And that uh, if you look at a tetrahedron, all the internal angles are 60 degrees. If you look at, you know, Egyptian obelisks, you know, the top of them, mm -hmm. they're at 60 degrees. It's like the interface, it's like the flower of life and all the other uh I met with Nassim Haramin uh, back in 2001. I shared my oh. ET experience. <laughs> and he said to me, that's it. That's, that's the structure of the matrix. Um, and so it acts like a, um, it resonates with the geometry of, of the matrix. Um, so what, what he didn't realize is that the, two terminations on the crystal they create a vortex and they they're counter rotating one's going one direction one going to the other direction mm -hmm. and they meet at a point and at this point if you stimulate piezoelectric with uh you can do it with your with your fingers you know but it's not as effective as if you uh hook it up to a signal generator and put two silver electrodes on it. Mm -hmm. And this in this area right here is the where the vortex forms. It um, it it creates this uh, singularity point, which opens up this vortex. And you're able to uh, imprint with your consciousness directly into the planetary matrix and cause an effect. Um, an interesting event happened recently that um, my um, my French friends, <laughs> Elena's in Ireland and John Charles Morin, who was um, on was in the Solar War and Secret Space Program. Um, he was doing a video production and about his experience in japan and i was listening to some japanese music and um and he was thinking oh elena would uh would love to hear this, this is such beautiful music he was thinking about her elena on the other side of the planet in ireland just happened to have her function generator turned on and opened up the vortex in her crystal while she was feeding her two cats in the kitchen <clears throat> and the cats perked up they heard something down the hallway and she went over there and there's like this japanese music coming out of the crystal <laughs> whoa and um and what uh i asked jen han about that and he said that uh, it uh it opens up this connection in the void which uh allows this uh type of connection but it wasn't his specialty. His specialty is more on um, other aspects. In fact, he's he's kind of excited because he's on one of the intergalactic confederation ships, and they're twenty thousand years ahead of their science of the Palladian science. You can imagine the Palladian sciences are like um, thousands of years ahead of us, um, and so there is this. Um, there is this amazing science that we're just scratching the surface on. And um, yeah, the, the last communications were the construction of a frill generator. Frill is the term they use for the universal life source. They believe that, the, or they know, that the quartz crystal is the purest uh, element in the universe that's connected connected directly to source and and so is water they act as interdimensional bridges and they're all part of a core um fractal formula that like love is as well but of a more complex uh form so they all uh interface with each other and so what happens is that when you um when you stimulate the quartz crystal lattice in a particular way that creates a torsion field with using uh, two perpendicular coils, one of copper for the electromagnetic and one of silver for the etheric, 
what happens is the phase conjunction node that happens within the crystal creates this uh, generation of frill. And the frill can be used for, it, it's like, it's like healthy stuff you know it's like it helps your body <laughs> you can uh use it for uh plant plants will thrive on it and so i'm working on uh with two scientists you know we're doing a cad and trying to <laughs> it's kind of complicated the uh try to get these two coils at perfectly 90 degrees you know to each other um to interact with the crystal and then uh, take the frill that's emanating from it. And I've ordered some um, fused copper tubing and right, seven right-hand turns that will transfer it into the water. Mm -hmm. Marcel did that with uh, wine. Uh, there was a winery in California that had this rotgut wine. And he took a, a crystal and charged it with the essence of his fine finished wine. And seven right-hand turns it was uh, using stainless steel, uh, transfer the vibrational essence from the quartz into the you know, the water. Everything has water in it, you know, into the wine. And what happened was it turned thousands of gallons into a California award winning wine. But, you know, you couldn't really mark it and say, oh, it's been crystal enhanced, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was able to stamp establish that that method was able to be transferred into the water there's a uh, there's an interesting relationship between the geometry of the molecular intermolecular bonding angles of quartz and that of water and that uh, in quartz it's like 52 degrees and in water it's the angular harmonic uh, multiples of that of 26 degrees and 104, 104.5, almost 52 degrees, this is slightly off. But what happens is, what I've noticed in my research is that uh, I call it angular harmonic resonance, where you have an angle that's a multiple of an angle. And there is similar to like an electronics, you know, where you have a, a signal and you're going to have odd and even order harmonics. You know, I used to be a broadcast engineer and we had a, I took care of a 151,000 watt transmitter and one of the harmonics was being on a, there was a structure that had a parasitic uh, resonance with the second harmonic and we had to identify where it was and short it out. And hmm. what happens is the music and everything that's playing on the fundamental will be played on the harmonic and so um information is transferred you know harmonically so with the um with the seven turn thing and the um sort of uh attunement of the you know worse wine became better wine could we take holy water and sort of attune like an entire river to holy water yeah uh, you can <laughs> you know there was an experiment marcel did with he got uh from hungary from a sacred spring uh, he said he's never seen uh the energetic signature was off the chart he took a big vat of bulk water you know unstructured water took a single drop of that sacred spring water into the vat of of bulk water now every single drop in there had that same energetic because water will mirror and the higher forms the lower like i mentioned earlier the lower doesn't form the higher if you take that that vat of water that is all structured right has that same sig signature and you take some unstructured water and put a drop into that that unstructured drop will become structured. Uh, it won't. It won't unstructure the whole thing. So mm -hmm. it shows that uh, it's it's kind of interesting that um, it's like our thoughts in the matrix, uh, in the planetary matrix. When uh, when you have a higher vibrational thought, it influences. Um, we did an experiment, Elena and I, where we had 
she has you know 110,000 subscribers we had about 1700 people live with her crystals and uh and so what we did was this experiment taking the information of both Marcel and Jun Han and had everybody go through a visualization of a, a beautiful positive timeline you know where the dark elements were uh, taken care of, the new technologies released, and, uh, you know, the, the world is, is this beautiful situation. So we took everybody through that visualization, and then everybody had their crystals, and then they fully formed that in their consciousness, and everybody at the same time, you know, projected that into the crystal. And, you know, without crystals, you know, it's been scientifically established that, you know, square root of 1% starts this kindling effect of which mm -hmm. is, you know, 8 billion people on the planet. It's like less than 9,000 people start this effect and more people, of course, the better. Um, and what happened was uh, somebody was monitoring the Schumann resonance and there was a huge spike on it. And we find out there's this uh, reciprocal relationship between the human resonance is like uh, they dub it the Earth brainwave because it, it it's almost like an EEG uh, pattern and operates within the frequencies of human brain waves. And so there's this reciprocal relationship between the minds on the planet and the planet itself, and it, it created the spike. So I believe that the uh, working with the crystals act as a uh, a way to an enhance that by amplifying the the connection you know the coupling of it speaking of uh nasim hermine and the schumann residence i interviewed um uh i'm blanking on the name he made those thrive documentaries anyway he was with hermine and a bunch of those arc crystals in the great pyramid and they did a an overnight sort of meditation and mm -hmm. uh the next day got a call from the like russian geospatial agency they're like basically it seemed like you guys set off a huge nuclear bomb or caused an earthquake um we had such a huge signal and they're like what were you doing and they said oh we're just uh we're just meditating with these arc crystals in the pyramid interesting interesting yeah. Yeah, well, the inside the pyramid. Oh my God! You know, what a what a way to amplify. Um, okay, so there's yeah. a bunch of there's a bunch of things that uh, you've mentioned that I want to um, some some crumbs oh, that I, I I just wanted to mention quickly in yep. the uh, in the uh, 1980s and 90s. I worked with Dr. Robert Beck, who would. Uh, and he did some work with the CIA and things. He gave me some papers and somebody broke into my house. And they, it was the only thing they stole was the documents that he gave, you know, mm. from the CIA. But uh, essentially, um, back in the 70s, it was called the Russian woodpecker, where the Russians were um, sending signals that would heterodyne on our 60 hertz they're on 50 hertz grid on 60 hertz grid and would fall within the psychoactive window um and started affecting people now he he traveled all around the planet and measured um kahuna medicine men different things and found out when they were in a working state of consciousness they were at the the 7.83 hertz uh Schumann resonance and their left and right hemispheres were synced perfectly together and an increased in amplitude. And um, I, when I was working with the Navy electronics, I was working with this Navy captain and we were working on the satellite equipment then. And he would wrap these things up in his sleep. You know, we do it all, all the time, right? And I, I was building these different oscillators that can tune down to a hundredth of a hertz. And I didn't realize I accidentally put it on the frequency that causes the left and right hemispheres to do synchronize, causing spatial disorientation, right? Hmm. Uh, the CIA has these little pins that if you ever get hit with it, uh, they simulate the Earth's resonance so that it overrides an external signal because you can, you can disable people 
uh, by sending that frequency. And I, I had the frequency counter on period measurement on frequency. And so I, I didn't know what frequency was. It was a perfect double blind experiment. The uh, captain was trying to wrap this equipment and he, he, he was like so disoriented. It was comical. <laughs> he threw his hands down in the side and said, what the hell is going on here? And then I looked up at the there and I switched it back to frequency. Oh my God. You know, it was like a perfect double blind, you know? Um, and so I, I did this work with Dr. Robert Beck, who substantiated a lot of this with this, the Schumann resonance. I just want to share with you. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. There's more, there's more there. Um, so I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning. You walked into Marcel Vogels and he said, are you from another planet or you're from another planet? Uh, that, was, that was the first thing he ever said to me. Yeah. Are are you? <laughs> um, I, I don't have any recollection of uh, you know, I'm uh Jen Han has apparently has scanned me and they know I was a scientist in Atlantis in a past life. I don't remember anything about that. Uh but you know, I I don't know. Have you ever been curious about i don't know doing like a hypnotic regression or past life regression to see uh some of your other previous lives the last time i did that was in 1977 and that brought about that et interaction which elena described the being as being an emithor which is one of the council of five and they're a, a benevolent they kind of look like grays but they have like they don't have like no nose they have a little cute nose and they have big eyes and large cranium um, incredible amount of love coming up out of its eyes but uh no i haven't uh <laughs> i've kind of backed off since then oh interesting okay any particular reason um, they just have enough to process and deal with, <laughs> with, with my current, uh, you know, reality here on earth. And I also wanted to ask you, um, sort of what, what you're, uh, what's motivating you these days? Like, why, why are you doing the work that you're doing? I feel like the whole planet has been duped and, um, uh, you know, I spent 10 years after, after I gave my testimony in Washington with the other witnesses, which we were backed by 500 witnesses, you know, we were revealing, you know, bases on the other side of the moon, 57 different species, the president's CIA directors being denied access that uh, we've had faster than light craft built back in the fifties and the mainstream media uh, completely sanitized up from the public's awareness. Myself being an ex ABC newsman uh, when I was a broadcast engineer I took, it was like the place was packed, 22 cameras in the back row. I, I didn't understand what was going on. Um, and CBS wanted to do an interview. And I said that we have the scientists that can prove we have zero point energy. We don't need nuclear oil and coal. They promised absolutely. I said, I wouldn't do this unless I could say that on the air. And they said, oh, I'm sorry, the higher executives made me cut that part out. And we know that the higher executives are, you know, from the intelligence community. So a uh, media company out of Hollywood wanted me to write an article on the control of being a, a witness and an ex-ABC newsman, the control of our perceptions, you know, through the mainstream media on the UFO topic. And so I gladly accepted. I, the only way I could, I didn't know what Operation Mockingbird was, you know, in, in 2001. And so I started putting together all these witness testimonies that I was aware of. I mean, we had 500 witnesses, you know, that were backing us. Wow. All, each one of us willing to testify under oath, penalty of perjury, breaking national security, you know. Um, and uh, I, uh, I started back to the beginning of the 20th century, looking at all the leaked, authenticated, classified documents all the witness testimonies, and I started plugging it in. That was the only way for me to comprehend what had, what happened. <laughs> why is it, why is a solution to the world being suppressed? Um, and then I started to realize what happened. And if you go back to the history, it's like the the most um, bizarre science fiction movie. <laughs> plot you're and it keeps its own best secrecy because the real truth is so 
far from our indoctrinated reality. The you know we've been taught in school. Turns out the you know Nazis before the end of World War II had the plan to create a matrix of perception. They call it Weltanschauungskrieg, which uh, they did. Uh, they controlled the media. Uh, they controlled education. They rewrote the history of World War II, 1946. Uh, Hollywood, it, it, the whole the whole matrix of perception. So for through generational indoctrination, we don't know the full truth of what happened, and that the uh, uh, you know the Nazi SS basically entered into an alliance with a reptilian race called the Draco of the uh, Sikar Empire in Antarctica it was given them advanced technology, which violated the Prime Directive, and so in, in the interest of balance, what happened was the uh, Galactic Federation of Worlds came in and worked with the U.S. Navy, who it goes into a long story with longer than we have time for. But uh, basically, during the Eisenhower administration, who wanted to have go on television, radio and um, release this, that he got circumvented by the MJ-12 group, who entered into an agreement with the, uh, the Nibu and Draco alliance. And the whole thing went, you know, deep black at that point um in fact in uh in 1993 i traveled to area 51 and the first time bob lazar ever was meeting with a group of researchers uh no recordings were allowed whatsoever but i had it on my camcorder on my, my lap and recorded the two hours of him hitting with questions which has been consistent over the years but that meeting created a um the uh, the base area 51 went into a complete lockdown and a classified uh, nro national reconnaissance office advisory went out to all all their different connections and somehow dr stephen greer and in the same year 1993 um he was meeting with the cia director uh uh, uh William, uh, James Com James, uh, James Comey. Yeah. No, wait. James Woolsey. I'm sorry. I had a, had a blank there. Hmm. Um, the CIA director, Clinton wanted to find out about the UFO situation, but the CIA director is being denied access. Uh, every single president, CIA director, head of intelligence ever since Eisenhower lost control back in the 50s, which he tried to warn the American public kind of cryptically right uh what happened was uh that uh he uh dr stephen greer who he brought into a three-hour meeting you know the uh cia director saying to him i know the subject's real i'm trying to figure out why the hell i can't gain access to it and so dr greer met with military advisors to start a collecting witnesses i was like the 100th videotaped witness that he collected starting in 1993 oh, and wow. so somehow dr greer was able to acquire that nro document about area 51 which had a distribution list that was revealing the other knowledge special access programs that uh bob lazar was working on reverse engineering the the craft and brought it to a Pentagon meeting with the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Vice Admiral Thomas Wilson, along with uh, astronaut guy, Dr. Edgar Mitchell and uh, Commander Will Miller. And this, the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he was denied access. In fact, he was threatened that he would see an early retirement and lose rank if he didn't drop it immediately. Uh, he was mad as hell and told Dr. Greer, if you can get your people, he knew he had started collecting witnesses back in 93 to uh, go before that are willing to testify under oath, willing to go before the mainstream media. You have my permission. This group is illegal, quote unquote. And so that's mm -hmm. what brought about the event that I participated in back in uh, 2001, over two decades ago. Um, and the public is still, you know, they're seeing little glimpses here and there of information putting it together but the the media is definitely the enemy of the people they have been you know deceiving the american public for a long time toward an agenda that is not in the interest of the people of the world so in 2001 when you brought 
when you had all these people coming together and you thought this was going to just boom, change the world because this information totally. would get out. I thought and... it was a part of a world changing event. I, I mean, I couldn't believe the other witnesses that what, what we were disclosing to the people of the world and 22 cameras, a place packed with reporters, you know, how could this not change everything? And so the, you, you mentioned that one TV show that you went on where they like, then they took out the clip later on. Yeah. Yeah. CBS all those, channel two, Los Angeles. Okay. All those cameras and all those reporters, were they all just not recording or were they, all told not to report on this like what what happened what happens is um <laughs> you know everything got recorded right but when it gets back to the corporate office for the editing room what they do is they selectively cut out there were so many explosive <laughs> statements that were in the whole thing they totally omit the um the witness testimonies and they talk about dr greer and dr greer is you know saying these objects of extraterrestrial origin have been tracked on radar going thousands of miles per hour stopping and making right hand turns cut right after that and we've already uh studied these technologies and have developed them in the united states great britain and elsewhere you know uh and so you know they very selectively take out so what happens is all this incredible testimony, it gets boiled down to when it gets on CNN, CBS and everything, it makes it sound as though it's what's called what the intelligence community called a limited hangout. In other words, they only hang out the part that's safe, that won't compromise their agenda. And so the perception that the guy coming back from a hard day at work, drinking a beer or whatever, um, <laughs> He gets the impression that uh, they're wanting to have a congressional hearing on simply the reality of UFOs. You know, he's collected hundreds of military intelligence witnesses. And so that's the impression of the of the uh, and, it, you know, it goes for like a minute and a half or something that they covered. I traveled across the United States in the major cities um, every time. With but Dr. how is Brewer. no you know, legitimate reporter just really interested in covering this because I, I know journalists and they, uh, they're relentless, right? They, when they get a whiff of a story, they dig and dig and dig. And uh, so surely not everyone was compromised, right? Every journalist that was there, right? Your independent if, journalists. If and... you don't, if you don't, uh, follow the, the line of the higher executives before this is like top on the list, you know, the higher executives in the media are connected with the intelligence community. Sure. And if you, it won't, it, they may be some disgruntled journalists and if they raise too much of a stink, you know, out they go. And so, um, if you want to keep your job, you, uh, you follow the line that the higher executives are, uh, you know, the, the, the lady who was uh, interviewing me on CBS, uh, she was almost in tears. She was like, I know, I promise. I never had this happen before, you know, that the higher executives maybe cut that part out. You know, because I said they travel all the way down to San Diego from L.A. to, to interview me for about 45 minutes. And I said a lot of things, but I said, I'm not unless I can say this little 10 second statement, you know, and afterward, you know, because of my technical background and since we weren't, weren't able to have a congressional hearing, I volunteered, Dr. Greer set up a corporation. We had a database about 300 scientists that were civilian and inventors. And so for 10 years, I was meeting with scientists and inventors and just one nightmare after another, you know, CIA coming in, threatening them, people being murdered. Uh, so I, after 10 years, I just gave up on it. It's until these control elements are no longer operational, these technologies, I mean, there's over 6,000, it, there's a secret system in the patent office called sensitive application warning system. If any of your, it has to do with free energy, anti-gravity, super 
conductivity at room temperature, you know, any things on this list, you automatically get a national security order, which states that your invention has been deemed to be a detriment to the national security of the United States. So therefore, you cannot share it with anybody. Uh, I just recently did a show with Dr. Michael Sal, and I brought in one of these scientists who, you know, had his cars blown up, he was thrown in prison. He had developed a, uh, based on Nikola Tesla's design, a little small inexpensive unit producing about 300 watts of power. He had 63,000 of these made in Japan and I had to just bar the whole thing. Uh, you don't, <laughs> you don't they, go. They, did they confiscate them all from Japan or? They, they confiscated everything. Wow. Man, so this guy was pretty close to disseminating free energy. Yeah, yeah, a brilliant scientist. In fact, he's got a number of that he hasn't got a national security order on yet. Um, you know, inventions that uh, can pull energy and can create up to a, a megawatt of, of power. But, you know, the stuff that they have in the secret space program, you can imagine um, with unlimited funding and some of the most brilliant minds and even assistance from uh, off-planet cultures that are thousands of years in advance to develop the technologies that they have in the secret space program and seem make any science fiction movie um, seem kind of weak, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> compared to what they have. So you're saying um, this guy's inventions are great, but they're the ones in the secret space programs are much more powerful, generate a lot more energy. Uh, yeah, in the secret space part, they're, they're you know they're, they're far developed. You know more than um, and there's some brilliant minds on the planet. You know some brilliant scientists that come up with incredible inventions. But uh, you know, but you can imagine if you had unlimited funding and you know and collaboration to uh, put together some advanced technology. That I'm sure they have solutions. Uh, According to my friend Elena, who recently, um, and it sounds bizarre for a lot of people, but uh, she goes off planet with uh, Thorhan on a scout ship. And she was able to go inside. The moon is hollow. And there's huge manufacturing facilities that are making these holographic med beds to be released to the world and anti-gravity vehicles, free energy devices, all this stuff. I'm imagining that ever since uh it's kind of interesting that what elena was saying is that the regressive extraterrestrials the, the grays and the reptilians have been removed out of our solar system back in 2021 and it's interesting that uh, a navy funded arlington uh institute think tank uh greg braden just had uh uh robert john peterson rather on and three independent sources verified that the, these regressive extraterrestrials have been removed from our solar system and that um, in other words the the minions on earth that were the the dark elements on earth the human element that was having this support system you know from these uh dark extraterrestrials they're no longer have that though they're on their own and right now uh, the deep state is basically, um, you know, pulling out all stops. And I think the uh, the people of the world are starting starting to awaken more. Mm -hmm. And I think once uh, once we can get a certain critical mass of awakening of the reality that uh, has been hidden from the world, uh, and we understand that, I think, you know the uh, Nuremberg type trials would start going on for crimes against humanity, all of the uh, human trafficking, child trafficking off planet and on planet. And all this would um, be exposed and ceased. Uh, and uh, these technologies released and a new world uh, could be experienced on this planet. So, Given that you you've already experienced like the the system shutting shutting you guys down, trying to disclose all this, you know, in two thousand one, to 
like, oh, wow, there's med beds being manufactured on the moon and free energy devices that could be dropped in at any moment. Um, how close do you think that is? Like, how, what do we need to do to make that happen? Like, because you kind of have a good sense of what we're up against and like how the tides are right now. What, what's your sort of projection of the next few years? Like, when are we going to get the good stuff? That's the question everybody's asking. <laughs> You know, it's like, when, <laughs> when is this going to happen? How much longer do we have to put up with this? You know, um, the timetable is unknown to give a date is, you know, it, it doesn't work because it's in dynamic flux changing, you know, constantly. Uh, it's, um, uh, it feels like it's moving, uh, Thorhan, uh, just met in a underground military complex in uh, Raven Rock uh, and gave it to General Van Herc, who is head of the North American uh, Command, this device that gives a whole plan for disclosure. There work, there's a Earth Alliance made up of Earth humans mm -hmm. <laughs> that's working in alliance with the galactic federation of worlds that you know the head of the israeli space program mentioned uh that you know president trump's aware of and that they're they're not quite ready yet to be revealed to our population you know a little more time is needed for us to be ready for contact uh but the plans for disclosure are in work right now and so uh, what will probably be happening is more of the Confederation ships will be seen in the skies. More people will start to see it and acclimate to this. As you can tell in the mainstream media, you know, it's talking about UFOs a lot, but it all is putting the, you know, threat narrative with that. Um, you know, one of the things that was revealed at the 2001 press club is Von Braun, uh, Renner Von Braun, so that was one of their plans is to have a false flag alien threat, you know, or to be contrived. Uh, it was interesting that uh, one of the things on the long list of false flag events, the next one was terrorists. And this was May of 2001. Everybody knows what happened in September of 2001. Um, so um, can't give a date. But uh, the indications are that the disclosure plan, working with the Galactic Federation, and we, all the good guys are here <laughs> uh, in the solar system. And the bad guys are out, have been removed, you know, according to uh, a Navy think tank. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I feel optimistic. And and you're concentrating your efforts right now on making this uh, physical frill generation device. What what else are you spending your time on besides you know coming on our podcast? Yeah, with with uh, with Genhan uh, Iradion, um, it started out with understanding some of the scientific basics of you know this. Um, uh, tetrahedral fractal geometry and the interface of consciousness and how consciousness projects geometric patterns that interface with this uh, matrix that we're in and that uh, how um, how to uh, one of the things is how to clear the crystal of all the previous imprints the crystal needs if you're going to be working with crystals it has to you have to clear it out because or else it'll taint the uh, whatever you're doing and so I'm currently working on, um, uh, there's like four different methods that that do this, and only one is really practical for the general public. Mm. Uh, so I'm, I'm working on that currently. Um, what is that the, method? Uh, it's using a uh, 4096 hertz that uh, brushes in the three axes of the crystal that what happens is it resonates the crystal lattice structure and uh, breaks the bonds of any other uh, patterns that are locked into the lattice so it essentially erases and clears the crystal out hmm. um, now the trouble is I'm finding that uh, these uh, 
you know, tuning forks. They're not exactly um, on frequency <laughs> that we use. And so I, I believe in order to, um, to effectively resonate the loudest, it has to be at exactly on the frequency, but I'm, I'm getting that. I'm currently working on confirming, confirming that while at the same time working with these two scientists on, uh, building the uh, coil structure for the frill generation uh, of the crystal, which has implications for not only um, you know regeneration for the human body, but also uh, could be used for irrigation. You know, to feed since we're having <laughs> so many issues with uh, our food supply lately. Uh, mm -hmm. It'd be good people able to grow productively you know food that's nutrient i understand they're wanting to put uh you know what they what they inject in people into our food uh, just, biden just uh signed a executive order to uh allow that to start happening and an informed consent is not something that they require to do so you know all these things need to be brought to the public's attention of of uh these elements that are going against humanity if you if you got the frill generator to work um are there other applications as well um uh the other one was uh telepathic communication through opening up the the vortex within the crystal that through the uh but um like with fact, the japanese uh, music yeah, exactly. Like uh, Jen Han had to get, uh, that was the second thing that he had to get permission. He had to get clearance in mm -hmm. order to, um, you know, share. But um, now, could you, could you use that to establish like permanent telepathic links? Like, could you use the crystal to like, if we were to practice, you know, using the vortex in the crystal and then could we like turn the crystal off and keep that connection? Do you think? Um, it has the potential. It has the, you know, I don't have enough information as, as yet to, you know, fully elaborate on that. But uh, from what I understand, the when you're able to go into this open vortex of, that connects to the singularity that's connected to everything <laughs> um it acts as a uh as a connect it's similar to you know how the quantum devices like uh the device that elena has that communicates with them the, they use quantum you know they don't use electromagnetics like we we do mm. um they use an and their power generation on their planet era that Jen Han shared with me, uh, they have these giant crystals that are, you know, they're talking six feet tall that have this wire configuration that generates a torsion field and it connects to these pyramidal structures that transmit. They see all of their, when we were talking about wires, he didn't understand what we were talking about because they don't use wires. Everything's wirelessly. Every, uh, the, uh, power and everything that they use that is generated now we can't we can't go into obviously uh power generation yet until the deep state elements are taken down as i had 10 years experience with <laughs> um could, you know could we could we like let's say jen han who is a a palladian or, or what's his uh... yeah he's from the planet era he's a palladian okay. Um, let's say he like dropped, dropped you a working model. Like you woke up one day in your laboratory, you just had the device cause he left it as a present for you. Uh, you could, you could then just start to copy and manufacture it and sort of disseminate it person to person, right. Without anyone knowing. Uh, no, I, uh, it been authorized for me to be able to share this with all the Terrans, they call them, you know, the people of earth. Uh, so I can freely share all the information. In fact, all the notes are on marcelvogel.org. There's a link there, and you can see the PDF with a uh, hundred pages of questions and answers. So I'm authorized to be able to share this information. 
So he's he's not going to drop, you know, teleport something in my in my office. Okay, my... <laughs> but but so um, what I'm saying is like you could circumvent the deep state. Like you said that we would have to uh, we have to wait until the deep state is no longer suppressing this. But you're already talking about it, right? Yeah, well, it's it's quite apparent the deep state's alive and well on planet Earth, um, and and you know, there's far more of us than there is of them, and well, that's what I mean. To... You haven't been you haven't been shut down disseminating this information. No, I have not been. I have not been. I'm. I'm not touching certain areas. You know, I won't. I won't go into energy production. Energy production would be very dangerous for me to get into. I'm just. Uh, what I'm doing is uh, practical healing methods and different applications that crystals can be used for the benefit of humanity. Um, if, as Jen Han said, if it's not, I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> So, um, you know, I'm just basically doing uh, benevolent uh, applications with the use of crystals, not anything that would threaten the power structure that the deep state is controlling. Other than the consciousness of uh, <laughs> helping helping to uh, awaken more people. Mm -hmm. um, I remember seeing a diagram where there's like, purple crystals around that same generator do you know what those are like what is what is the complete oh, frill oh well generator Elena like? saw she saw yeah. that uh there was like uh i think six purple like crystals that were at a different angle and, and was feeding it into a pyramid she um she physically saw that and so she was you know recreating the image and mm -hmm. i don't understand the um mechanisms of of how the crystals interfaced with the larger crystal gotcha so the future future research or further information needed is that right uh yeah it's um you know the their technology is so far advanced so i'm kind of i'm kind of doing a kindergarten level here of, of uh of understanding the uh the crystal technology what uh what do you still want to ask Jen Jen Han? Like what's what are your sort of burning questions about this? Well, Elena and I were planning on doing uh you know, if you go to Elena Danan, uh D A N A A N dot org, uh her website, uh we're doing it going to be doing a series of uh, crystal classes and how to utilize the crystals. Um some of them are going to be based on uh not only Dr. Marcel Vogel, but um, what, the latest information with Jen Han um, on on healing techniques that people can use with a crystal, and um, and different applications. Um, one of the first classes is going to be on how to completely clear the crystal, the previous imprints, because you have to you have to do that first. And, uh, and then how to use the crystal on another person or how to do it on yourself. Um, and then, uh, and then a lot of it's going to go into, uh, theory of, you know, the, the, um, uh, you know, I, the, my two scientist friends are hitting me with all these, all these, uh, all these questions you can imagine, um, to understand the, uh, the physics of how they do it on planet era that's different than how they do it on planet earth so um we will probably explore that does planet era have the same physics that we do totally totally different or thousands of years in advance um you know or they live their average lifespan is uh you know 900 to 1500 years our average lifespan on planet Earth, last time I checked, was 75 years. Um, the, uh, you know, I'm, I'll be 74 this next week, <laughs> you know. Whoa. Yeah. You don't look 74. No, I try to 
have a good diet. <laughs> maybe, maybe you're already using your crystals. Oh, uh, I don't know if it has anything to do with it. I think it's uh, being, being in a harmonious, loving state and eating organic food and, um, you know, all that helps. You mentioned this term planetary matrix earlier. I was wondering if you could expand on what that means. Yeah, the planetary matrix. Uh, Thorhan, <laughs> I mean, not Thorhan, but Jenhan rather, knows a lot about this being a terraformer. Um, it is, it is this matrix in which all life is interconnected to on a planet. Um, like say, he said, for example, if you were to use a, a crystal from Mars, it wouldn't have, doesn't have a resonance with Earth. It only resonates with Mars. If you have Earth crystals, um, it resonates with the planetary matrix. Our bodies, our DNA resonates with Earth. You know, we're, our bodies are made up of the Earth. So we're part of this uh, planetary matrix. So we have the ability to, the planetary matrix affects us and we have the ability to affect it. And, but you were talking about like nested platonic solids as being part of the planetary matrix. I'm sure that that's part of it. As I researched over the decades, I, I find that the platonic solids are in planetary bodies, the planetary orbits there's a, a fractal relationship from a proton to the universe that's a scaled fractal relationship you know our dna has this uh, uh the decahedral uh geometry to it even the uh, periodic table of elements has this um uh, tetrahedral geometry that uh, relates to the the different elements that we have and it's interesting on the um on the secret space program on they have what's called replicators you know you want to replicate mm -hmm. a you know a cheeseburger and a chocolate shake you know it'll it's like you can record and play back <laughs> you know um and so um yeah, the, it's it's amazing, uh, the sciences that we will, you know, our, our whole system's been infiltrated, um, uh, corrupted, our education system, science, we don't, we're not taught the full physics that, uh, you know, these scientists are fully aware of that or have been working in these, uh, these other projects that the public's not aware of. We've been talking about uh, quartz. Um, there's a lot of other crystals that people use in metaphysical practices. Um, are there any other significant crystals uh, you've come across? Quartz is the most universal. Mm -hmm. um, the other crystals that have, you know, like amethyst, rose quartz, garnet, uh, diamonds, rubies, emeralds, you know, they all have their... Uh, their particular geometries within them that have their own qualities, you know, but they're they're specific to those particular qualities. Whereas quartz has a universal matrix that is resonant to everything. It's like water. Water is also resonant to everything. As they dug down in Antarctica to these ice core samples, they found that in these ice core samples that every single one of the seven major classes of crystallography are exhibited in water, showing that it has this ability to be universally resonant with all the geometries. All the, um, all the crystal forms, is that, is that what you mean? Yeah, in, in water, as it, as it turns into ice, as it transitions, um uh, it can form in different geometries mm -hmm. and those geometries they found to be across the entire spectrum that uh, we know of in the world of crystallography gotcha 
Yeah. So water and quartz are sort of intimately linked uh, yes. because of what how they can sort of bridge dimensions and how they're universal sort of. Yes, they both act as uh, interdimensional bridges. Okay, interesting. Anything else that interacts with quartz and water in the same way or functions the same way? Water. Uh, you know, water is a profound study, you know, when you understand uh, the geometry of it. And it's interesting, both water and quartz are both hexagonal, right? Mm -hmm. And um, this uh, hexagonal structure appears to be the basic fundamental of the uh, of the matrix which is you know tetrahedral and hexagonal that's really interesting every time i do a uh psilocybin journey i see like a honeycomb i start like getting mm. a lot of uh i always attribute it to bees but it's like i can see the honeycomb um sort of structure beneath that's I, I hadn't put that together before yeah yeah that's the structure of the matrix really interesting hmm. in fact it's written about in some of the ancient uh writings you know madame blavatsky and the secret doctor and talks about the ancient stanzas of Dizian, whereas the uh the matrix is this hexagonal matrix which has you know the six sides but in the center is the uh is with spirit it was where it emanates from the from the and it, it's interesting that was kind of related to that question mm. I asked Jen Hand about the uh <laughs> the, the ah, center yeah. the center of the hexagon there is something um something very special that's happening there yeah interesting I love I'm your just, questions by the way Derek I'm They're just great. yeah <laughs> <laughs> I'm sketching out the um, the if you have those two triangles, right? Then you have the hexagon in the middle, and you have six points, but you also have six uh, vortices of interaction. So you essentially have like twelve twelve points there, and then you have a point in the middle, and it's thirteen. Um, hmm. There's something there. I'm gonna have to. I have to think about that. Um, I feel like I'm. Uh, I feel like I've covered a lot of the stuff that I wanted to ask you about. Oh, I'd love to hear a little bit of. I saw um, you live. You were telling me you live off grid in the kind of in the wilderness, and I think I saw that you live in a in a dome that you built. I'd love oh, to yeah. just hear a little bit about your living situation and. Uh, yeah, it sounds kind of experimental in a way, or or trying to weave in a lot of your other research and interests into your into your well, home. When I was working for the government on uh, all their electronic equipment, I was trying to plot my escape. <laughs> you know, I wanted to get, I wanted to be uh, self sufficient and not have to hustle, worry about you know getting for money. And so my my dream was to be able to be completely self-sufficient out in nature and you know not needing to so you know after i did some work uh i had an internet business and i uh was able to figure out search engine algorithms and was able to make a blast a little blast of money in order enough to purchase some land and so i uh came up to oregon and found a good deal on a piece of property that was up on top of a mountain and uh i ordered this uh this kit <laughs> that uh this geodesic cement it was the first cement geodesic dome in oregon mm. and i met my wife up here and then we both worked together and we put it uh we put it together <laughs> you know 300 pound triangles yeah they had to bring a crane and everything and cement the whole thing together um and so, you know, initially I just came up in an Airstream trailer. I was living, we lived together in this Airstream trailer for a few years. And um, the uh, I've set up, you know, a solar array and I had internet connection. And it was great, you know, because I have, uh, 
I don't have any water bills. I have a well that's that powered by some solar panels that uh, keep us with water. Uh, we got plenty of power, uh, electrical power. Um, our heating we do with uh, dead wood on the property. We have a, a boiler that feeds a radiant floor to keep us warm in the winter and the summertime. We route the irrigation water through the floor, cools it, and an evaporator cooler. And so we have no heating or cooling bills. And because we're on top of a mountain, uh, we're a relay for the valley down below for internet. So we send the internet signal down. So we don't have any internet bill, no, no water bills, no electric bills, no heating bills, no cooling bills. Uh, our, our, you know, phone, we use, uh, you know, Skype, which is like about 30 bucks a year. <laughs> so basically, and we're growing our own food. We built a greenhouse and we're using these um, growing towers that use uh, vermicomposting. And each tower yields about 50 plants and we got about six of them. And so we're producing our own food, which is, that's our, that's our main expense that we have is uh, food. Um but uh, all the rest of the bills have been eliminated pretty much. And uh, so we live like uh, millionaires on a beggar's budget, you could say. Um, <laughs> so your, your food budget is like supplementing what you can grow, like when you go to the grocery and get extra food, is that? Right, yeah, there's nothing, it, that, that's the medicine chest, you know, nothing like the life force and live organic food that hasn't been tainted and messed with <laughs> um, to uh, to keep you healthy. And so how about community? Uh, if you're uh, outside of town, like one thing that I really prize is just being able to run into people as I'm out and about on my day. Well, how's that been for you? We, uh, my wife and I are both hermits. <laughs> so, so we love being isolated away from everybody. <laughs> you know, so, okay. Uh, it works out really well that way, but uh, you know, uh, we have about 22 acres. I have a security system all around, you know, just in case uh, any crazies come. And um, uh, you know, we have just a few choice friends that uh, you know rarely we interface with, but uh, but yeah, that's our, most of our social life is unfortunately on the internet. <laughs> yeah thanks for sharing we um we put on pause but for the last couple of years we were building a community shopping for land sort of trying to get about 25 to 50 friends together to build a little mini village um it'd be like a sort of a scaled up version of your your place you know oh, but if you ever shared... need, need any uh, advice i've i've mastered the art of uh living well without monthly expenses amazing <laughs> yeah um <laughs> you know I, I saw our project as it's kind of like let's let's see what we can incorporate you know like we're all encountering really amazing ideas and uh either in, in building or in governance or food growing. So like, let's build a community, but let's also use it as a, as a canvas for, for experimentation. Um, oh yeah. Like Buck Minister Fuller said, you know, don't fight the existing reality, create a new one. The old one becomes obsolete and everybody moves over to it. That's yeah. That's the, that's the vision. Um, so we uh, we're having a, we're having a kid in June. So we kind of put the, project on pause until we can devote more attention to it but um oh i totally you know when these energy devices get released um, anti-gravity vehicles med beds you know we can live extend our lives you know hundreds of years um you can populate remote places on the planet there's plenty of places where you can have you know with you can generate you know your, your own food water power everything with a little small energy device that to give you multiple kilowatts and uh you know you don't even need roads so <laughs> yeah um, you know um, you can go anywhere the, I, I totally uh, recommend doing alternative you know housing so that you know the insulation and everything is uh 
you know, optimal, making the most of what resources you have, you know, for heating and cooling. I had, you mentioned your, your house was cement or concrete. Um, I heard it's like this... an R, R40 insulation. It's about seven inches of foam on the inside mm. and about an inch of concrete on the outside. And, um, and so the floor acts as a huge thermal mass that, um, you know, once it's heated, it sustains mm -hmm. for quite a while. I heard of this um, bioceramic, um, sort of like. Oh, right. You can, uh, it's kind of like creating like creating bones, but you're using most of the carbon from the atmosphere and then sort of 3D penetrating this bioceramic and do geodesic shapes and you can make these modular homes from them. Um, that seemed like a really cool concept to, uh, you could start with a small home, right? And then you could just like kind of add <laughs> blink, blink, blink. Add nodes oh, onto oh yeah, it. I'm a big believer in tiny homes. Tiny homes, you know, they, you can do it. You can do it so right, so that you know you you have all your basic necessities. You know, you think about it. You know, it, it, so much less the heat and cool, um, less to keep clean. <laughs> you know, uh, you have uh, you know so many benefits of having uh, plus less cost of materials, less taxes if you're you know for square footage uh and you can always expand you know you can always build a little barn if you have like you know a large collection of stuff you need to you know put so <laughs> for your laboratory yeah. right <laughs> you love about the lab yeah <laughs> yeah although i am i'm a huge fan of chateaus and like really nice big houses like it's a personal personal passion of mine so i'm trying to figure out how to how to weave those two together you can do it. I I've done it, and I absolutely recommend it and love it totally. Let's see if I have. Uh, I think that that kind of wraps up uh, a lot of my questions. Is there anything I haven't asked you about that you uh, <laughs> want to make sure you uh, touch on? Um. Ah, oh, I. I... I don't know. We we covered some ground. Um, I think uh, I think we're good. Um, I'm trying. Nothing. Nothing comes to mind that we. Where would you like to point people to to find out more about you or your work? Oh, uh, my! It's not a professional site. Uh, you know, it's just when that media company wanted me to write an article, I started. You know, decided to put it onto onto the web and then I just kept adding and adding to it. The webmatrix.net is a site that goes from the year 1900 to almost present day. I kind of like <laughs> if person people don't figure it out by uh by the last year or two what's going on, then you know there's no sense in me really continuing on any further. Um and you know, it's just like it's never ending the story, <laughs> you know, mm. as it keeps going. And it gets more um more uh way more bizarre you know if you're you haven't if you haven't researched uh it just it really keeps its own best secrecy because it just sounds too far-fetched for the average normal person to uh imagine you know such things are going on mm. okay uh well thanks Thanks so much, Dan. It's been, it's oh, been it's a pleasure. pleasure. Spend time with you. Pleasure. And um, yeah, I'll have to check out the latest uh, versions of the Bianchi bicycle. It was my favorite. Mm -hmm. I, I loved my, I used to polish my stainless steel spokes and true my wheels. And uh, I used to do like 25 miles a day and 50 to 100 on the weekends. And um used to love that uh, so much when I was uh, in my teenage days yep yeah those those bikes have always been good looking and uh when i was a teenager when i was 13 uh is when i started cycling and uh we would you know my other 13 year old friend and i we would go on these long sort of adventures and it was like the first taste of real independence right you know our parents didn't know where we were we could just like pick a place and just go there it's amazing yeah how cool and fantastic <laughs> yeah thanks so much dan great to oh my great pleasure to with you Absolute pleasure, Derek.